Hey, Mike. <laughs> I'm Jeremy. I'm Tony. Hi, <laughs> welcome to Oral. We, uh, we started Oral uh, November of 2020. 100% um, online, this was always the, the vision, but... Uh, COVID kind of got in the way a little bit. COVID definitely threw a, a, a wrench in that idea. Monkey in the wrench? Yeah, a fly monkey in the wrench. ointment? <laughs> um, so we went 100% online. So we, we started out um, selling restored vintage audio equipment online, 100%. Um, and then uh, actually started in my house within a few months of launching the site. Literally by the end of that week. <laughs> by the end of the, so the first day we sold a piece of gear, sold a piece of gear every single day the rest of that week, and we weren't advertising or anything. This was just through our own network. Um, by that Friday, we had shipped a 2100 to Australia. That's true. Yeah. And we looked at each other, we're like, uh, we're gonna need to get out of your garage, Bob. Yeah. Well, I mean, we had gear on every surface of my house. I turned a back bedroom into a into a photo studio, and so uh, it, which is in the lower level. So humping gear up and down the stairs every day got old. Um, not having anywhere to eat got old. Um, you know, shipping out of the garage got old, and uh, it just it just grew so quickly that uh, within by uh, by January one we were in a warehouse space. Um, and uh, in, in North Denver, or north of downtown, which is Globeville. Literally Gen 1. Yeah, literally Gen 1, we moved into that space. The, the evening before, we were moving all those racks. Yeah. That was our, that was our New Year's Eve. New Year's Eve was, was tearing down racks and loading racks into a <laughs> into a U-Haul. November 2023, 2022. 22. November 2022, we opened the retail space. Let's, let's have a look around. Everybody asks, is the wall real? Is it live? So these are all Hartley, vintage Hartley drivers, um, 24s, 18s, 10s, and 7s, run by a pair of Mac Kit 30 monoblocks, a pair of MC40 monoblocks, um, and a couple of solid state Mac amps, stereo Mac amps. But it is live. We use it for DJ events, <coughs> live concerts. Highlight of this wall, the, the right half of it for this for sale. We got a mixture of new and vintage from the 225 over to the 15 W's with the 275 in that system, 240 that's uh, that's actually being um, upgraded right now, um, and uh, four amps up front, four two amps up front. It's a complete history of all of the original Macintosh amps before they went solid state. So, 1949, 1969. And then there's our famed Model 9s, which are going to a great customer of ours in, in New Jersey, but near mint pair of original Model 9s. And you'll see we've got vinyl throughout the space. Um, you know, we're not really a, a record shop per se, but uh, we often, whenever we're buying gear, um, it, the, the question comes up, do you guys buy vinyl as well? And so... Um, and tubes. And tubes, yeah. <laughs> we, have, we have a hard time saying no to vinyl. Um, so we, we buy it whenever the opportunity arises. And, and you know, we, we, do, we do organize it and sometimes grade it and price it. But for the most part, um, we just throw it out and let our customers dig through it. 
you know, our uh, our famous pair of uh, orange heresies <laughs> that just so you know we did for ourselves, right? These uh, these we wanted a pair of orange heresies. You know, obviously our, our color our, our company colors are orange and white. We uh, we had a good customer of ours who has a shop that restores vintage Ferraris and Porsches and Jaguars. Amazing cars. Right. And so they, uh, one of his guys shot those in his booth uh, with high-end automotive paint. And uh, so that paint job is a $1,000 paint job to get those that way. The big horns you're seeing aptly um, are, are called the Rocky Mountain Big Horns. Uh, they were, they're one of four pairs made as a production prototype. Um, you may have actually, if you went to Rocky Mountain Audio Fest in 2008, you may have seen them. They brought them there to do uh, kind of focus grouping, field research, see kind of what kind of reaction people had. And actually, uh, the story, as the story goes, they, uh, at least one of the publications nominated these as the best horn speaker of the show. Unfortunately, they never went to production. But what's really interesting is they're set up with this, with this, this is a, a port tuner, so there's, which, which allows you to put any size driver, any size full range driver into this cabinet and you can tune the port to, to load that driver. These are, this is Blumenhofer, Jadis, Soda. These are Blumenhofer Genuine FS2s. Absolutely unbelievable horn speakers. The, this is the Blumenhofer Tempestas, running off of a Maxi 27 and 2205, and a customer sword Thorin's TD125 long body. Veneered in figured eucalyptus with a custom Ortofon 12 inch tone arm. This is Thomas Steffen, our service manager. <laughs> so this is, this is where we, we shoot all of our equipment for the site. So this is for speakers, that's for components. Um, and this, this, this area also um, does double duty for detail and uh, assembly. This is our, our shipping and receiving. So where we box everything up if it sells online. Um, we've also got kind of our, this is our speaker test area. So we go through things when we get it in and see what the condition is, figure out what drivers we need and, and other parts for it, as well as just kind of storage for the boxes of gear out in the showroom. Kind of the least exciting part of the, <laughs> of the back. Um, this is probably my favorite area is our actual electronic repair. So we've got three benches set up. Um, we've got three techs here, and we work on all sorts of stuff. The, the goal is we make everything at or above factory spec. The majority of the things we get in um, don't work at all, and so we have to fully revive them. And then everything else is not where it should be. Meaning it powers on, it'll work. The big things, the big things we find are amps don't have enough power um, from where it was originally spec'd at or distortions high so we check everything when we get it in we make our notes um, and then it kind of goes on to the next level of finding parts to bring it back to where it should be if you look at this mac tube amp it's all point to point wiring so everything all the components all the resistors all the caps um, there's a wire going straight across there's no boards there's really not a lot of 
hard to find parts, meaning there's no ICs, there's no op amps, there's no boards, there's no chips. Whereas the newer stuff, if there's a trace broken, we may or may not be able to repair it. If there's an op amp they don't make anymore, we're searching eBay and it's kind of 50-50 if it's gonna be a good part or not. Um, so we try to make everything as special as we can. Um, we try to go above and beyond. So this one has been a full, like every cap here has been replaced. All the filter cans here are getting replaced. Power supply has been rebuilt. Um, a couple of these resistors were out of spec, so those got replaced. This one got a new pot. It's getting new RCA jacks. Like really, we're gonna make these as nice as you're gonna find. And then on our other side over here, this is our cosmetic restoration. This is our, our wood shop. Um, We've got, right now, mostly speakers out, although we also have a couple consoles and things we work on. This goes from refinishing to like touch-ups of corners or things that have been kind of dinged up, uh, as well as if you see, we got a couple of speaker stands on the, on, the, on the tables right now. So those get repainted. Um, again, for things like that, we get a lot of 3D printed parts. So on these stands here, one of the one of the the end caps was missing. So we 3D printed a new one and it fits right in. You're not gonna be able to tell the difference. Most of the, the speakers we restore, we put in different binding posts just so we can use bananas with everything. Um, so those corn walls there have got Cardis banana plugs rather than the original kind of screw in terminals. Your story's bespoke in design. Can you share with us the story behind its eclectic design and how it reflects the essence of your business? Wow, that's a lot. That's a lot to unpack. Um, how it reflects the eclectic design. So let me back up. The, the idea behind the shop really started um, started kind of from my my personal aesthetic, which is very mid-century. So my I also collect mid-century furniture. My house is mid-century. Um, and so I was looking for things that fit into that aesthetic, which there aren't a lot of, right? Um, there are some things vintage, but, um, but it, it all kind of fell short of what I thought that, that look should be. And so what, how we started this, or how, I, you know, how, how this began was, was restoring um, vintage speakers in the way that would fit with my aesthetic. Right, my, the, the aesthetic of, the, of my house really was, was what I was going for, was what I was trying to accomplish. And, and looking at it in, from, a, from a lens of what, what would they have done if money was no object? You know? and, and they were really thinking about it from a design standpoint and less of a, a business or just sound standpoint. How do you curate your inventory given that you offer both new and used high-end offerings? Well, all of the new gear that we bring in is really vintage inspired. Um, we started out looking at brands that had revitalized a lineup from you know, the 60s or early 70s in the case of the Mission 770. Um, the, really the core of all of the gear in here is design forward. Um, back in the day, there was, a, there was this old term, you know, wife acceptance factor, and uh, we're really focused more on just acceptance factor. This is gear that you want to be able to live with and enjoy. Um, you, have to, you have to feel it in your space, and it has to feel synergistic when everything comes together. When we're out hunting for new brands, um, you know, going to shows, going to like Expona, and you know, um, I spent a lot of time, or we spent a lot of time, looking for pieces that we think are going to be cool in 50 years, right? Things that have a timeless design, um, that aren't following the trends, right? And, and that's maybe one percent of what's out there. You know, so much of it looks like it belongs in a spaceship or or in a drug dealer's house in Miami, or, you know, like it's, it, it's that aesthetic, which, you know, whatever, you know, to each his own. But for us, 
we're trying to find things that are that are warmer, simpler, um, that that fit into a, a mid-century slash modern aesthetic, um, and are, and are really our um, our audio as art, not just objects that make sound. What is the biggest challenge in running a high-end hi-fi shop in an era where people are consuming their music on digital devices and earbuds? Well, first and foremost, I think it's a challenge to combat the idea um, of, of sound quality. Um, I experienced that myself. I grew up around this gear. My dad was a broadcast DJ. Um, I had my first turntable when I was four. Uh, but in the mid-90s, I fell into the, you know, multimedia PC trap, I suppose. Um, and I was really, I, I really appreciated the allure of a single device that would do everything for me. Um, fell into that for a number of years, and it was, it was only after, you know, I experienced two-channel audio again at Jeremy's house that I thought to myself, what have I done? What have I been doing all these years? You know, I, I've, <laughs> always, I've always appreciated music. I've always appreciated good audio. And I've made sacrifices for convenience. And in this day and age, uh, those conveniences have even come back. Um, so being able to sit down in the living room, uh, turn on a, a vintage stereo, and control it from my phone, you know? Hi-fi over Wi-Fi is really cool. Can you share a story of when someone sold you a classic piece of hi-fi gear that was a holy grail piece for you? <laughs> <laughs> you know... I don't know how long you got. <laughs> yeah, right? Um, wow. Uh, it, what's interesting is along this journey, the idea of holy grail keeps changing, right? Um, I mean, I think early on... Um, Pretty much anything Mac felt holy grail to me. Anything, anything vintage Mac was holy grail. Sure, while you were assembling the Mac collection. Uh, yeah, while we were assembling the collection. Yeah, it was... Uh, Every piece of consumer tube amp that Mac ever produced from 1949 to 1969. That's right. Or at least an example of each, yeah. not every single one. Right, in stereo pair. Um, so, I, I mean, the whole, the big, looking back, the biggest holy grail pieces are probably the the 15Ws Mac 15Ws which are the the first consumer tube amp Mac ever made um, and we've got two of them so a stereo pair of them it's the only two I've ever seen and we bought them separately um, but and I've got alerts out in the world I'm constantly looking for those kind of things and I've I've never seen another come up so I mean that's pretty holy grail. Um, our pair of Moran, original Morantz 9s in museum condition, our pretty holy grail. Um, what do we think, what, what else do we ha have we had that was just, I mean, the one for me, um, again, because, I, because I'm so in love with mid-century furniture, not the kitschy kind of mid-century furniture, but you know, think Eames Lounge and Barcelona chair, like that, kind of, kind of clean, simple line. Um, the the JBL Paragon has always been, you know, that that elusive piece, mm -hmm. um, and we were fortunate enough to find a Metragon, uh, actually locally in a local auction, and uh, and so that's a piece that I'm that I, I'm really excited about being able to restore. We, we've rest restored it electronically. Now um, our wood restoration team will restore it cosmetically, and it'll be it'll be you know better than original when we're done. Now, are, are these products that you plan to sell, or are there any that you find that you want to keep for yourself? See, that's the hard part. I want to keep it all for myself. You know, I, gotta, I, I have a hard time selling any of it. Um, Everything's for sale. You just have to want it more than we do. Right, 100%, right? Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, I, I think like, like every hobby, um, I, I've got to be able to play with it. We mm -hmm. want to play with it for a while, right? And, you know, I, I think eventually maybe, you know, we'll be open to, uh, to selling some of those pieces, but, um, but the, the, the luster of, of having them play with them hasn't worn off yet. So, 
Um, yeah, I don't know. The, the Metragon is one that I looked for, you know, Metragon or Paragon for so long that I, uh, I don't know that I could part with it. But like Tony said, I, you'd have to want it more than we do, right? Can you tell us about your Macintosh collection? <laughs> um, so my first Mac piece was a 2100. Um, within, within a month of my first speaker restoration, um, I was mono-blocking a pair of 2100s um, and had a full Mac system. So uh, C27, pair of Mac 2100s, um, I think a 7008 CD player, all in cabinets. Um, and uh, from that sprung, okay, well now I've got something that looks like a, like a tube amp. I really, really want uh, a Mac tube amp. And uh, in, in my house, I've got a, a 20 foot long built-in bookshelf, bookcase. Like, it's like a library, right, library wall. And I was uh, in, in the process of trying to um, scrounge books old books from friends uh, to fill this thing because it was so big, right? And I'm, I'm not, even though I'm a reader, but I'm not, I don't have, that many you know, books. a thousand books or whatever it, well, it, it takes. I mean, it's, it's a lot of books. Um, and so people were, were coming by and dropping off boxes of books and I was filling this wall and one day was staring at it going, you know, I'm never gonna read any of these books. This is just for show, this is dumb. How cool would it be if this wall was full of tube amps? And from that little kernel of an idea um, was, okay, well, what if it was a complete history of all the Macintosh, original Macintosh tube amps? Um, and then I started looking at, okay, what does that mean? You know, how many pieces are those? What are those pieces? And, you know, which gets you into, you know, start, you start learning about those hammer tones, you know, the really early pieces um, before they were in Binghamton, you know? Um, and, uh, which was a fun rabbit hole, and and like any hobby, you know, the hunt is, you know, is is part of the excitement of it, right? The chase. Um, so I uh, I had, I had told my girlfriend at the time, um, you know, maybe, you know, two to five years of this, um, the lion share of it was done in eight months. <laughs> <laughs> like I had a wall of amp in eight months. Um, was still missing a few key pieces, like a second 15W. Um, I was missing a 50W, 50W, missing a really clean uh, original 275. Um, and uh, at the time, was, was traveling a lot you know, uh, for work. And, uh, and so whenever I was going to an area, somewhere else in the country, I'd, I'd hunt and uh, finally found the 275 in Charleston and, uh, and brought it back in my carry-on. <laughs> Stop. Yeah. I don't, I never heard that. Oh yeah. I, I've actually done that a few times. I've, I've brought a handful of amps, handful of Mac amps back in a, in a piece of luggage. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I mean. Taking that through security? Oh yeah. Yeah, I, I, every time I thought they were, I thought they thought they were gonna think it was a bomb. Sir? Every time, never said a word. Weirdest thing. <laughs> Never even question why do you have this large thing, this large metal thing in your, no questions. Wow. So weird. What advice would you give someone who is just starting their journey in hi-fi, especially when they enter your store? <laughs> what advice? Um, I usually like to tell people to start with speakers, get a, get a good listening base, um, hear what a heresy sounds like, hear what an L100 sounds like. And that way you've got sort of this point of reference when you're talking to other people who are into this gear. I, don't, I hesitate to say audio files, but uh, people who appreciate two-channel audio. Um, it's, it's a conversational point in the very least, but for a lot of people who've spent a lot of time listening, um, you know, if you could say, uh, it's got a little bit more bottom end than a heresy. Um, or it's a little brighter than an L100, that, that helps me get a reference point, a, a basis point of where, you know, what that thing might sound like. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's good advice. I mean, I think, listen to as many things as you can. 
right? And, and try to make your mind up yourself. Like don't get don't get stuck in the forum rabbit hole. Um, totally. You know, don't ask the question, what are the best speakers? What are the best, what's the best amplifier? What is the best amplifier for these speakers? You know, those are so subjective. Um, learn that lesson first that everything is subjective. So figure it out for yourself. Um, and I don't mean figure it all out for yourself. Obviously, come ask us questions. Mm -hmm. You know, find find mentors, find find people that you can ask questions that, that because most people you'll find in this hobby want to talk about you know their their gear, their experience, their you know how much they know. <laughs> mm -hmm. We all know those guys. Um, so leverage that, but but yeah, I mean listen to as many things as you can, um, and then start as simple as you can. Uh, mm -hmm. And try not to pigeonhole yourself. And I think that's a great point. Heresies are a great starting point because anything will run a heresy, right? From a flea watt amp to you know a monster receiver. It doesn't matter. It's you know it's a, it's a sensitive speaker. It's a, it's a great reference point. Yes, it doesn't have a ton of bass, but uh, every audiophile, at least almost every audiophile I know, has has owned a pair or owns a pair. Mm -hmm. Right, it's one of those things I tell everybody. Hey, start there. You can get into them for forty six hundred bucks. Do that, you know. And they're simple to recap. They're simple to restore. There are a lot of upgrades. You know, so there's a lot of fun you can do with it for not a ton of money. Right. The other way I was going to say the other way that a a, a newer person could kind of pigeonhole themselves in this space is kind of at, uh, at price points. So there are, there are certain price points that, um, you know, kind of open up a whole, a whole wide range of gear. Um, so sometimes it helps to kind of uh, push your budget just a little bit so that you've got an upgrade path in the future. And an example of that would be, um, let's say someone comes, they've got to have a turntable. Okay. Now we have to run. The, we have to hear the turntable. So we've got to be able to. We've got to be able to, you know, power that thing. Um, so in terms of putting together the entire, you know, cohesive system, um, you know, is there is there a place to kind of push the budget and get yourself to a place where you're walking away with something that has, um, you know, future trade-in value, like a like right. a heresy, for example, versus. Uh, you know, I'm saying maybe push the budget a little bit to reach for that heresy rather than to buy the, you know, entry level, you know, speaker that yeah. happens to be the speaker du jour on, you or, know, Amazon yeah, some, or some, YouTube reviews. Yeah, some Sansui, you know, uh, lattice grill or something, you know, which seems to be, you know, people think vintage and, and see the lattice grill and go, ooh, you know, and it's... Uh, it, it tends to be a, a starting point because they're inexpensive. They've got a vibe, um, but they're they're really, you know, they're they're mid fi at best, right? Um, and and you're right, they're not going to have an upgrade path. Um, I think the other the other advice is is, is start simple, um, and preferably start separates. Um, because you, that gives you, like I said, it gives you an upgrade path. You know, receiver, you've got to replace the whole thing and go into separates. Um, but, you know, start with a, a good amplifier, a good preamp, or decent amplifier, decent preamp. Start Dynaco, something like that, you know, that's small, inexpensive. Tried um, and true. Tried and true. Um, I think the other thing is, is, is find things that aren't intimidating, right? So, like, the Dynaco is one of those things that, if, if you have a little bit of mechanical acumen, you can do some work on. You can replace some caps. They're really, really simply put together. Most of them were kits to begin with. Um, so, and I would, I would also say do as much as you can yourself, right? You know, like, like get a pair of heresies, recap them. Um, one at a time. Right, definitely one at a time. Hear, hear the difference. Um, get the Kreitz. Tweeter diaphragms. Do that yourself. You know, like like get get comfortable with the parts, get comfortable with the components, what they do, how they sound, what the differences are. Um, the more you you have hands on, the, the better off you'll be in the long run. For someone buying new gear, how do they know it's going to have an upgrade path? How do they know that it will be worth, or at least hold its value, 10, 15 years down the road, to where they can 
they can then use that to buy something different. Because with new gear, it's, it's all brand new. There's no telling. Do you think it's more of a gamble, like rolling the dice on that? Wait, wait, new gear is like buying new cars, right? I mean, it, it, it's going to depreciate. There are a few, even, even the most sought after things, even things that, that are a year out for us to get. Uh, if you look on the secondary market, they're still not going for new retail. Um, so, <laughs> you know, that, I guess that's, that's the challenge in new. I mean, it's, you either want new because you, you, know it's, you, know, you know it's history, you want to be the first owner, I mean, I, that's a good feeling, I like that too. Um, but know that you're going to take a hit on, you know, you, you, and not really a hit. I, I always think of it as you, you've, it's that new. extra, what, what, you, the, what you make on it when you sell it again versus what you paid for it. If you didn't ha have that, that amount of fun with it, then you're doing something there wrong. There you go. Right? There that you difference. Go. You know, it's not an you investment. Paid for, it's fun. Right. You, you paid for the, your time with it. Yeah. Right? Um, on vintage gear, um, there are definitely pieces that you can consider an investment. Um, and you can track those over time. What that investment, you know, how, how that, that pays off, and that, that's a tough one. Um, but if you look at what a Mac, you know, a, a original Mac 275 was 10 years ago to today, you know, it's, it's, it's more than doubled. You know, it's, it's worth, when we're talking about the difference between new and vintage, it's worth kind of mentioning what the real differences are and, and really kind of how, how this business got started. Just really the idea of rescuing and restoring, you know, that gear, keeping it out of the landfill. You know, when you see, when you see postings for an MC275 that are described as, you know, an antique Edison bulb tester <laughs> or something like that, um, you, you start to realize there's a lot of people who don't know what these things are and, and they could very likely, you know, end up in a pit somewhere. So the beautiful thing about this old gear is it was all repairable. It was all made to be repairable. And, you know, like a 57 Chevy, if you've got somebody with the right tools and the right know-how, they get it back on the road. Yeah, um, very few pieces of it are proprietary. Right, and that's, that's the key, like, you know, pre-1979, almost everything on all of this equipment is, is repairable. Uh, the closer you get to that, that cutoff point, the more you start to see PCBs and proprietary ICs and those kind of things that, um, that are harder to find and harder to replace and, um, you know, you start Easy getting into break. it. Yeah, you know, um, but pre that, everything, all the parts they were using, all the caps they were using, all the resistors they were using, all the um, you know, transformers they were using, they were all, all things that, that everyone else had access to. It wasn't something that they were making themselves typically. Right? So we can, we can replace almost all of that. And luckily there's enough of a hobby that the things that we can't replace, um, which is rare, um, guys are parting them out. You know, so you, you, can, you can typically find it somewhere. You mm -hmm. know, and uh, much like a 57 Chevy, right? Those parts exist still. Mm -hmm. um, where, you know, when you get in the black-faced, you know, plastic stuff, you know, there's no, there was no, there's no benefit to having, the, keeping those parts around, mm -hmm. right? We had a hundred dollar piece of kit. And if we can't find the parts, we 3D Pro. That's right. like we're doing right now. That's right. How do you see the future of Hi-Fi Audio in the next five to 10 years? And how does your store plan to adapt to these changes? The future of Hi-Fi Audio? Um, I think uh, I, I think we're we're seeing uh, a renaissance in it. You know, I think we've we've the pendulum swung from audio as a showpiece, as a central piece of a living room, to uh, components being hidden in closets and hidden in cabinets and designed to to fall away. You know, which is why they were black, so they didn't reflect. They, you couldn't see them in a cabinet. Um, now they're coming back out. I, I think that pendulum swinging back to people appreciating music um, and that ex the experience of, of, of intentional listening. Um, and, and with that, they want objects that, that, that are beautiful, you know, that, that are our conversation pieces, our things that, that they are as in love with when they're off as when they're on, right? And so I, I think the future, I think we're just now starting to see the beginning of that. You know, we're still, you know, even though turntables have, you know, turntables and vinyl has, have been seeing a renaissance for the last 10 years, um, 
that that really didn't necessarily correlate to audio equipment. It was just vinyl because vinyl was cool, right? Um, now people are starting to understand that vinyl actually sounds better, you know. And and oh, if I if I level up on my on my my amplification and my speakers, oh my gosh, what an experience! That, you know how much more I can I can get out of this experience and out, ex- of, out of that medium. And experience really is is what it is. I think. Agreed. I think that's in a lot of ways what's really kind of driving that renaissance. Um, you know, we hear all the stats about you know vinyl eclipsing this or that you know sales, and I don't have all the metrics in front of me, but um, there's something about that experience, that tactile experience of having to get up off the couch and flip the record, you know, and drop that needle. It, it's, a, it's a deliberate, it's an intentional act, and you're focusing. It's, it's almost like a, a, you know, perhaps I think for some people it's a digital detox. It's yeah. an unplugging. I'm going to just sit down and, and enjoy this analog system. I agree. I, I agree. I, mean, I, th- I think it, 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 it's in line with, like, the slow food movement or, right. you know, I mean, all, all, the, all these things that are, are about stepping back and appreciating things that are tangible and real and um, and and often nostalgic. Um, I think that's that's part of the allure of it. Um, I think the thing with with vintage, why it's so why it's striking the chord, why you're seeing it so much more in TV shows and in films and out in the world, um, is that um, it, it's it's obviously it, it was built different than what you see today in, in the big box stores. But there's also some kind of soul that comes with it, right? It, it, it's got history. It's been through several people's hands. It was, you know, often, you know, brought from a war, you know, back home and, you know, it, it, to, from a simpler time. I mean, there's so many things with it that, that are attached to that object that it isn't just, you know, something that, that sounds, you know, sounds beautiful and is beautiful. Um, it's got a story. And I think that's part of why it's so attractive. 